And these are not clocks keeping real time, they're just, just counters, but, um, uh, but they can use them as time and you can use them and you can use that clock ordering to order all the events in the distributed system in a, you can get a, a, a linear ordering of them that preserved causality. The, okay, the, the basic rule for, keep, for, um, for maintaining these, these clocks is that, uh, first of all, whenever an event happens uh, at, a, at a place, that local clock gets in advanced. So you don't have two events at the same place happening at the same time. Uh, and, um, oh, you know, it's, it's possible that two clocks read exactly the same thing, but you, you sort of pretend that there's a decimal point at the end containing the, the, the location that identifies the location, so it's impossible for two clocks at two different places to have exactly the same time. And then the other part of it, the part that... Uh, Johnson and Thomas missed is that when you receive a message, you have to advance your clock both later than its current value and later than, oh, that each message has a timestamp attached containing the time at the sender that it was sent, the, so, that local time. Right. And when you receive a message, you have to advance your clock so it's both later than its previous value and later than the value on the, attached to the message you've just received. So that's the whole algorithm for... The thing is you take a partially ordered set of events and by introducing these clocks, you totally order them. And then I realized that being able to totally order the events gave you the power to implement anything you wanted in a distributed system. Uh, that is, they were only thinking about their particular uh, distributed database system, but I realized that I mean, having this global ordering uh, allowed you to uh, implement you know, almost anything.